Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by an American musician and songwriter who hails from Baltimore. My guest formed the band Disappear Fear in 1987 with her sister Cindy. The group released several albums on their own label, Disappear Records, and would go on to sign for Rounder Records. The band remained active until around 1996 and became known for their songs about love, life, Baltimore, LGBT rights, and political issues. Since Disappear Fear disbanded, I guest embarked on a solo musical career where she has recorded several LPs and performed in many countries, including Jerusalem, Fiji, Australia, and Germany. She has received several awards for her music and humanitarian efforts and has shared the stage with her heroes including Bruce Springsteen and Pete Seeger. My guest describes her singing voice as somewhere between Paddy Smith and Perry Como, a guitar player in the Gypsy Kings and Richie Haven's flavour, and the songs you can hear some Beatles or Bruce Springsteen. My guest has composed music for film and documentary, has gone back to produce more recordings with Disappear Fear and other musicians. Today I talk to Sonia Rothstein. We discuss Sonia's upbringing and her Jewish roots, forming Disappear Fear in the late 1980s, her solo endeavours and her humanitarian efforts. Good morning, Sonia. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you, James. Nice to see you. And thank you kindly for taking part in this edition of, of Your Take many things to discuss and specifically talk about your musical journey but can we begin by winding the clock back and going back to the past to the very beginnings can I begin by asking you when and where you were born what are your memories of childhood and can you tell us who your parents are and what did they do for a living and do you have any siblings? Okay, I should have written this down. <laughs> yes, I have. I'll go backwards. I have two siblings, um, but I have half siblings as well. I've got an older brother, Rick, and a younger sister, Cindy. And that's who initially Cindy and I formed Disappear Fear back in 1987 because we always sang together. Um, I also have some half sisters, um, one who lives in uh, North Carolina, Sarah and Jane, who lives in Seattle and Allison, who is a dancer and lives up in it's a dancer, a teacher and a doctor <laughs> up in uh, Massachusetts. Um, my parents, Harry and Eleanor Rutstein, uh, were married in Baltimore and I was born in Baltimore. All my my uh, closest siblings as well and um, grew up in the 60s here in, in Baltimore. I'm, I'm in Baltimore right now on the other side, not very far actually from where um, well, I was born downtown, but, but maybe like 30 minutes away. So, um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Cindy and I sang harmonies in the bathtub together. I told her to get off my note because she was singing the same thing as me. And she started singing something that sounded pleasant. So that was how our harmonies, because I knew that people were singing together, but I knew they were singing that it was a blend, that it wasn't the same. It wasn't in unison. And, uh, and that's how and that's how we started singing harmony. So it was really our dream as little girls to be like our aunts, my my mother's uh, sisters, Sally and Robin. They were from New York and they had really cool accents and Sally played the guitar. And Cindy and I just wanted to be exactly like them. So um, then I started playing the guitar and, and we started singing harmonies and we just did it until we did it professionally and formed Disappear Fear. Does that help? Does that cover some of it? Yeah, musical beginnings, and you've given us a, a portrait of your family life back in the 60s and a description of your parents. Mm. I'm obviously going to come on to the the music and ask about the roots and 
going on to become a professional musician. But before we do so, I wanted to tap into your Jewish roots and background. Were your family religious? And can you tell us if there was um, a strong Jewish community in Baltimore? Most definitely. Um, there, there definitely is the uh, rabbinical uh, Hebrew College is located here in Baltimore, which attracts a lot of um, religious people from New York and from different parts of the country to study here. And frequently they meet someone uh, or, the, or, or it's an arranged marriage as in the old, old days and they settle here. So it's, it's really flourished the Jewish community here, both uh, in the Orthodox sense of it, but also in the um, more liberal Jew, Jew, Judaism, and that would be the Judaism that I am connected to. We grew up on what's called conservative, and it's it's a it's the step out of Orthodox. Orthodox Judaism is very um, uh, regulated as far as what women do and what men do. Um, women much more kind of Middle Eastern because there that's where it came from. Um, very uh you know children raising the children taking care of the household la 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 and the men study the torah the book um uh and um that's that's basically the reg regulation of the regulation of things in conservative judaism what they said was why not have um everyone be um, able to study or raise children. <laughs> and so um, it opened it up for, for the women. Girls were bat mitzvah as well as the boys bar mitzvah. Um, and to be, you could be a full expressive human being, Jewish human being, regardless of your gender. So that was a big step forward. And that happened actually here in the late fifties. I think it was like 1958 in my synagogue, Bethel was, the, was definitely the first one here. Um, to do that. So that was a big step. And, um, and gradually that occurs all over the country and, and all over the world. So we, I grew up what's called what we called American Jewish. So we kept meat at, for as far as like eating kosher, we would keep the meat separate from the milk, because you're not supposed to have a cow's milk with the with the meat. It's uh, considered morally wrong. Um, and there are other laws of keeping kosher too. Like uh, like in Muslim, um, but um, uh, I mean Islam. But um, uh, but occasionally we would bring home shrimp or bacon on paper plates <laughs> if it wasn't kosher. Um, my mother would do that, not my dad. My dad grew up Orthodox. My mom grew up Reform, so conservative was the one in between and seemed to work for everyone. Um, I think American kosher is a very apt term for many things um, that, uh, you know, my, my Jewish roots, my grandparents were all Jewish. Um, they came from Eastern Europe, from Poland, from Vilnius, um, Lithuania. They came from uh, Romania. So they all met here and voila, <laughs> um, here, here we are. Um, music's very much a part of Jewish culture. In fact, the this week, um, the entire service will be sung with a band and uh, my a, a drummer that I've played with who plays on one of my albums, Steve Raskin, he's, he's the percussionist for this group that's going to be playing. And it's really fun. It's, it's very, you know, it's uplifting and it's, it's repetitive. It's easy. It's, you know, you don't have to dress up so much. You be, can be cool and comfortable and uh, it's, it's, it's soulfully replenishing. A fascinating, fascinating insight into your family history and, of course, your Jewish roots. Can we now, Sonia, talk about your early education? Can I ask you where you were schooled and what are your memories from your time there? And did you have any early career ambitions and did you eventually go on to further education? Yes, yes. Um... I loved school. I was, you know, I, I went very early um, to pre preschool, kindergarten. I think I was like three. And uh, apparently, um, well, when my brother um, was a very kind of like solo traveler, he was like pretty 
zen and he could play for hours by himself and i was just the opposite i was like running all over the place my mother was having to chase me she said when they went to the beach everybody on the beach knew my name because she was running after me and of course a little one and a half year old can run a whole lot faster than a 20 you know 28 year old or something you know um but um um, let's see, early school, I, I went to, so, so I went to kindergarten and then I failed kindergarten. I didn't really fail it, but I did have two years of kindergarten because apparently they gave me the reading readiness test and I wasn't quite ready for first grade. So <laughs> then I went to first grade and, um, it was, you know, I think, um, school was, was, was a lot of fun. I had great teachers. Um, you know, I, I have many lessons. <laughs> That, that, that I learned and, and became good friends with people, of course. And um, it's positive, it's positive. Music was always part of what I wanted to do. I took ballet almost all day on Saturdays and a little bit of drama too. Um, but my drama teacher said when, when, when she asked the whole class to fall down, she said that when I fell, I didn't really fall at like I found sort of a comfortable position to fall into. And she knew right then I wasn't gonna be a good actor. <laughs> And I guess what um, appealed to me even very early on was my sister w uh, had a wonderful voice and she was like, I would, I, I even brought her in for show and tell. She had like, you know, little curly brown hair and she was adorable and, and, you know, I guess I was a little scrappier and, um, and so I was very proud of her and I was always trying to like, you know, say, hey, Cindy sing, Cindy do this. So when there was an opportunity, I remember the drama club, we did the song, um, um, uh, Smile by Charlie Chaplin. And, um, and so it was all girls. And then there was this guy that was Charlie Chaplin, but we all had the Charlie Chaplin hats and the canes and stuff. And we all sang the song around him. And he sort of like, you know, came in in that Charlie Chaplin walk. And then they wanted to give me this part, um, which went into I want to be loved by you, just you, and nobody else but you. And it was not me. I mean, I was like, no, this is this is not me. But Cindy could sing this. So I kind of pushed her into the spotlight. She got that solo part. And um, and I was in the background doing, you know, in my Charlie Chaplin drag, which was very comfortable for me. So but later, what I guess what what kept happening was that in somewhere in my universe, brain was um, that I wanted a voice that said what I wanted to say, because I didn't find anything that was what I wanted to say. And I guess the closest to that would have been Joni Mitchell, because she seemed to like really take the whole situation and look at the darkness and look at the light and really get, give some dimension to relationships. I thought that what I saw on television was you know, about as thick as the TV screen um, today, I guess, because the tubes were deeper, right, than back then. But, um, you know, just very um, plastic and not, um, not, not, sub not substantial, um, which is why I was really drawn to folk music, because they seem to approach, particularly when I became a teenager, um, Phil Oakes, because he really approached what was happening you know war is killing people it's, it's murder i mean there's no other way around that and um that is what they're doing and that was like it, that was terribly wrong and 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 seemed kind of absurd absurd and incongruous with what civilization and life seemed to be what I thought life was supposed to be about. So anyway, folk music seemed to approach that. So that started to get me approaching my own voice and finding that, finding my way through, through that. <laughs> I want to pick up on the, the music now, but there's no question that music was instilled in you at such a, a young age, a passion for listening to it, a passion for performing. And you've already mentioned this sibling relationship with your sister where you would do harmonies and were influenced by harmony groups coming on to the the music I wanted to ask about your earliest encounters listening and performing music and I wanted to specifically find out at what age did you start playing instruments and composing your own songs and were you a self-taught musician or did you have a a tutor and what instruments were you playing 
in the your kind of earliest discoveries of music at a young age? Well, when I was a, you know little, I would sing you know in in the bathroom because it had the best acoustics, and I would just sing in front of the mirror and you know do all that, and then bring Cindy in and stuff. And um, I was hoping in my in my fantasy brain that I that somehow the helicopters or planes overhead would hear me and go, oh, wonderful child, child talent, you know, and land and zip me out to Hollywood or something <laughs> and say, yeah, we're going to make you a star. You're wonderful. But no, that, that didn't happen. But we did sing. And um, I loved um, I loved singing and I love I loved the harmonies together. Um, I did try out for the uh, school band. My brother got to play the clarinet, clarinet or trumpet, trumpet in the school band. And when when I reached the the uh, the fourth grade, I got to try out. And Mr. Novak, the instructor, asked us what we wanted to do. And and I think probably what I said was I want to sing and play guitar. And he went, okay, thank you very much. And that was it. And so I didn't make it into the school band. And I was just I was so downtrodden. I was so crushed. And um, so I just decided I'm going to have to figure out this music thing on my own <laughs> at, the ripe, at the ripe age of 10 years old. <laughs> and so um, uh, and so what I would do is I would pull down the guitar. My, we had a like a Spanish, my dad made our rec room into a Spanish cellar and there was a martini classical guitar on the wall and I would take it down and I would play it and sing and it wasn't in tune. And eventually I realized it needed to be, I, I needed to, to know core, I needed to know something cause it was like, this is ridiculous. I can't really, this doesn't sound good. So I asked my mom to get, to, to, if I could have some guitar lessons and I got some guitar lessons and they got me like a smaller guitar a rented smaller guitar. But I was learning things like ding, ding, ding. You know, and I just, that was not it. I mean, I was already jamming with the people on the radio, you know, <laughs> and um, so that and following those little black dots on the page was not going to cut it. So that was, no, I mean, yeah. So um, in time went on and I, I, I would do, I would, you know, write and perform some stuff. I would, you know, get up my nerve and go in, in front of the music uh, school teacher and, and say, I can sing this song, you know, and so then I would get a solo and something and that was fun. But playing guitar really um, gave me a vehicle to, to move forward, to learn about notes and harmony, to, to kind of start to realize I'm not singing on key and what all those things are and how out of tune guitars are not so good and getting them where you want them like just kind of placing things as 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 time went on so in, when i was 13 i took 10 lessons uh from a community thing it cost um 12 dollars no seven dollars um um five dollars for the 10 lessons and two dollars to join the the uh group and she taught us chords and I brought in that martini guitar and I learned terrible bad habits, <laughs> some of which I still have today, um, many of which singing I still have today. But um, but yeah, I could still I could I could I could make it work. So me and Randy Snyder and it was that was the start. From the, the very beginnings, I want to talk about your musical career. And we're obviously going to be talking about the formation of the band Disappear Fear, but. Before we move on to that stage, can I ask you about your earliest experiences on the music scene in Maryland? And I wanted to ask what that scene was like. And can you share with us some of the early bands you were part of and what you learned musically from those formative years? Uh, yes. Um, well, in high school, I just kind of listened a whole lot. Um, I didn't play in a band. I was doing more folky stuff. I didn't have an electric guitar. I remember playing my friend Bertram's guitar, excuse me. And, and it was just amazing. Cause it like, when you first hit an electric guitar, at least my, the way he had it set up was it just went Wah! just like, you know, it was just like this like machine that just kept going and it was so cool. 
Um, whereas if my folk guitar kind of went ring, and the sustain was about about that long. <laughs> so, um, but I, I knew electric was going to be in my future too. Um, uh, so let's see. When did I start the first the first band thing that I did was called Sonia and the Night Band, and I came. Um, to work with a bass player and a drummer. We were a trio and occasionally we would have a guitar player. We rehearsed in the 930 building where the 930 club um, became a club, uh, I, um, which, which became, which is still today, it's in a different location. It was actually located that time at 930 F Street and they didn't have the elevators and we would just have to schlep up all our stuff, you know, four flights, it was in the summer, it was grueling. <laughs> And then we would get up there and play, but, um, and we, so I played in Baltimore and I played in DC, but I noticed that the bands that were in DC were like a lot better in a way. They were like more professional. They were slicker in a good way. Um, they just seemed to have their, you know, the whole presentation just seemed to be better. So my bar was more like the, if I could do what they were doing in DC and Baltimore, I thought I'd be on top there faster. Um, and so we took it pretty seriously. Um, and um, I uh, actually, that wasn't my first band. That was my first band. But the band before that, I was in a cover band in California. I took off from New York to, I was going to um, Manus College of Music. Um, and I was very frustrated because it was like, I had no academic education. And then I went into college, like, basically, like from kindergarten to college. I mean, I what I had done, but nothing super, um, you know, a couple of lessons here and there, which I really rejected. Um, I, I had this, this thing like, you know, you can't, you know, like, you can't tell me how to make love. You can't tell me how to uh, play, play a guitar. I, this is a thing that we each have to figure out what, who we are and what, what we do and how we do it. So, um, yeah, so the first band, the, I guess, band band was this cover band in California, and I played keyboards in it. I, and I hardly knew keyboards. I had this chart that had dots on it where you, for a C chord, I was like, okay, well, that makes sense, you know, these, this way, and then, okay, that's the D chord. And, and you know, most of those, a lot of those, we, we did songs like Ride Sally Ride, and uh, we did some Beatles covers, and it just really wasn't that challenging, and I was the girl on the keyboard, so, you know. I guess I wore tights and a skirt. I can't remember. <laughs> and it worked. And I got to do, I, I did get to do one or two of my own covers playing guitar. And um, that was really satisfying. And um, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a bit of the early stuff. I probably make this your take, like take too much. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bring your sister back into the, the picture, back into the narrative again. And, move on to disappear fear but i wanted to ask what the name means and can you tell us the story behind the formation of the band with your sister cindy frank yes definitely she um so she and i had this dream about playing together and um singing together and and in fact it's so sad because it's it's really in, you know that we're doing this interview today I remember we were like 10 or 11 and we were in, so I probably would have been 11 and Cindy would have been 10. She's about a year and a half younger than me. And uh, my brother told us, we were all in our, my, my, Cindy and I shared a bedroom and my brother told us that there was a bomb that could destroy the entire earth. And we were like, what? There's a bomb that couldn't? And he said, yes. He said, but he said, there's this ban, um, uh, called Crosby, Stills, Nash and Nash, and they have a song that's um, that's a really great song, and it's "We Can Change the World." We can change the world, and you know, David Crosby just recently passed away, so it was like that song and the idea of that was like, okay, music can do this. We can do this, you know. And that was, you know, we're kids. We're like trying to figure out. Well, okay, well, okay, let's see if we can try and do this. And so songs that I was writing really were in that folk kind of tradition, like maybe we can do this. And I remember I had a song um, that Cindy 
I don't know if she did the harmonies on or not. The song I lived in, the area that I lived in was called Pikesville. And I wrote a song for my Pikes for my high school graduation called Ville Pikes Flu. And um, it might have been my junior high school graduation, actually. But anyway, it talked about living in Pikesville like a, like a disease, like the disease of materialism and superficiality and, you know, things that just really didn't um, further our unity as a planet <laughs> that I thought was bad. So um, um, Cindy and Cindy had gone off to Detroit and to live with her boyfriend and go to college. I was, I had just finished college and was back in Baltimore and I was sending her cassettes. What I would do is I would write songs and send her a cassette and she would send them back to me. Um, she would like put different harmonies on it, but she was going like tape player to tape player. So eventually it was really distorted and really didn't sound that great, but I think it gave her practice and an understanding of what my songs were. She loved, always loved my songs. So eventually she and her boyfriend broke up and she came in to live with me and it was insane. It was just crazy. But um, we, she joined the band I was in, which was called Exhibit A, an all-female rock band. And her enthusiasm was no less than mine. And we sort of blew the band out of the water. We were like, well, I don't care about rent. I don't care about paying for health insurance. I don't care about, you know, the car. I mean, we'll, we'll, make, we'll figure it out, you know? And they were like, yeah, right. You know, they, they were much more sensible people. So, um, so basically the band exploded and Cindy and I were left with her and me and my guitar. And that's where Disappear Fear started. And, uh, and we were just like, let's do this. Let's do songs that mean something to us. And, and go for it and when when you mentioned that when you just mentioned you wanted to compose songs that meant something to you it kind of comes on nicely to my next question because at the beginning of our conversation where you said you were that girl performing in front of the mirror with hopes of stardom and a musical career you also mentioned about doing things that had authenticity for you that had purpose and meaning and when we talk about meaning I wanted to ask about the band's songs and their musical output because you were always exploring themes on the records which which addressed things like love life Baltimore LGBT rights and also political issues why did you want to write about those things and why were you particularly passionate about them, particularly also with your folk influences as well? Um, I guess. Um, it just seemed the best way. It seemed to me that when people are singing together, there's no hierarchy you know it's not really about who's got a strong voice who's got a weak voice it's not like there's an ego there it's just a it's just like a sort of illuminating your breath um all together and it's the best feeling and um that i you know that in a group situation you can have and i think I just thought, well, that's the way to fix these, this, this, you know, at the, which was the Vietnam War at the time or the Cold War with, with Russia. I mean, it was just a way that the whole world could come together because essentially we all want the same thing, shelter, love, safety, food, um, a fast car. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, you no, I mean, seriously, we, you know, sorry. Yeah. Inter interestingly, as a as an artist and somebody composing their own, own songs, do you think these these subjects and things you felt so strongly about? Do you think it was kind of a good way to vent your anger in some ways by expressing it in song and in music? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the things that was really important to me, and one of the differences between the band Exhibit A and the band Disappear Fear, was that disappear while exhibit a members there most of us were gay uh lesbian um uh we didn't uh, we didn't 
I didn't write anything that said, I love you, you know, you know, it, to, to a woman. I mean, it was still, it, we had a, we had a sort of a budding, um, LBGT following, but, um, it wasn't really catered to that. And we were sort of dissed about that in some ways. But when Cindy and I started Disappear Fear, we just decided, um, look, I happen to be gay. You happen to be straight. Let's just, you know, sing it like, like we feel it. And I actually wrote a letter to, uh, um, Jane Sibbery. I don't know if you know who, do you know who that is? No, She's I don't know. Beautiful, um, singer songwriter, major talent from Canada and from Toronto. And maybe she'll be on your show sometime. And I was a huge fan of hers because she was so out there and she was so, not that she was gay. I don't think she is, but, um, she just had a real command of just so many different levels of music and it was very exciting. And I, I just said to her in a letter, cause you can do that with a stranger cause she wasn't a friend really at the time. I did end up sharing the stage with her several times at different festivals, but, um, uh, anyway, I, I wrote her a letter that said, I have to, you know, be true to my own music and true to my own heart. And I'm, and I'm going to do this. And, and, and she was just like, oh, you know, you good, do, do what you're, do, do what you have to do, you know, awesome. And it was just like this, you know, declaration to myself, okay, I'm moving forward this and uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but, and, um, and so we did. And Cindy was just like, look, you happen to love women. I happen to love guys who cares? Like, you know, why can't you guys hold hands? Why can't you kiss? Why can't you just do what you're doing? And this was the eighties. And so it was like, um, you know, so we just, we just did our own thing. And I think Cindy was great in that. She was just like, that's absurd. You know, like she, it didn't really hit her until it was me. And, and, um, so yeah, she, but she, she's like a Scorpio and she was just like, yeah, love is love and we're moving forward on this. So, um, so we just did it and we just, our harmony sounded, we're, get, we're getting stronger. We're sisters. She could follow me down the off, you know, she could, she did all the hard things, you know, if it was the getting real high, I'd go down and she'd go up. She would go anywhere to make it work. She was very facilitating and it empowered me to just really find what was strong for me to focus in what I needed to. And she loved my lyrics occasionally. She would say, well, maybe we should have the word teddy bear instead of pubic hair there. <laughs> you know, I had some strange rhymes, I will say. Um, so yeah, she, she was amazing and she really helped broaden things. And um, yeah, she was, she was, we were very, we were like the indomitable duo. <laughs> yeah. As a, a music duo, you released six albums. Which record from that period are you most proud of and why? And secondly, I wanted to also discuss releasing music via your own label, Disappear Records, and also about your creative output after signing to a label in 1994 and kind of find out your perspective about that and how that went, that transition. Um. So, well, our first record was uh, officially was echo my call and um that was when we were just really launching um i was writing songs i had written songs that i had done with the band and then the band broke off so i just hired other musicians to help back me up on the record and um um i guess the one i, I really i'm i'm proud of all my children i uh i would say that the most powerful one. And, um, although I do really draw from my, my entire catalog still, um, is, is disappear fear self-titled when we, when we did go to, to, uh, Philo rounder records. Um, cause that was just, just a magical experience. Um, because we knew the record had legs as they say, and, um, there was just a great buzz about everything and everything was just really, uh, you know, we were talking to different publishing companies um, in the U.S. and um, yeah, it was it was a very it was definitely a magical time. Um, there was another question in there, but I think I didn't. It's, it's it's interesting because I've spoken to a lot of musicians, and 
they've been divided in terms of signing to a label and some have said that they made that mistake making the leap from being a, an independent artist and taking that risk and being signed to a label it seems like your experiences being uh, signed to a record label were positive and I kind of just wanted to ask you what the kind of differences were in terms of maybe your creative freedoms and and so on from being an independent artist to you know signing that that contract what happened was we had our first album echo my call and the last song on it was called because we're here and um i had when i worked i I was in New York City when I went to when I was going to the Recording Institute of America and Manus College. And one night I just I just couldn't take it anymore. I had gotten on stage. I, I played the bitter end and and I felt I wasn't myself. I felt like I wasn't in my own skin. And within 24 hours of that, I gathered my money out of the bank. I bought a sixty nine dollar go anywhere in the United States Greyhound bus ticket. And I went out to California. My brother lived in Santa Rosa, but you know, everybody goes to, <laughs> all the people in the 60s went to California to find themselves, find each other and find their music. So I figured that's where I'm going, you know? So that's where I went. And um, my brother actually met me at the bus station and I ended up living with him for about six months and his family and got a job. But one of the things that when I got the job out there was there was a guy that um, on the uh, committee um, where I worked on the board of di directors for delinquency prevention, um, spent a lot of time in El Salvador and really talked about his personal experiences there. And I knew a lot of what I, I didn't know a lot. I, I just was very upset with what it seemed like the United States was doing or not doing. It seemed like there was some really nasty business going on around there. I don't think I knew as much as the guys in the clash, but I, I was very um, uh, upset by it and frustrated by it. And then my friends, two friends, I lost two friends, they disappeared down there. So that was definitely a part of my mind. And I wrote this song because we're here very much out of the uh, influences of Phil Oakes, who was a contemporary of Bob Dylan's. Phil Oakes, though, really said, I, I, I say, Bob, I say, I say politically that Bob Dylan was like, um, Budweiser and, and, and Phil Oaks was more like Guinness, like more people like Budweiser because <clears throat> it's a lighter beer and everybody can enjoy it. Guinness is for the hardcore, you know, like you got to really like beer to like the dark Guinness kind of thing, which is admirable, but isn't for. Um, I, I really tried to further the footsteps of Phil Oaks in, in that, in the, in that song. And, um, the, the, the chorus is, we're not marching to El Salvador because we're here. And it became, we're not marching anywhere because we're here. And it actually, I did it in Spanish uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an album in 2006, completely in Spanish, Por que estamos aquí? And um, it's with a really cool, like, kind of African beat. But I say that and I bring out that song because... Um, we brought the, the the album to the biggest independent label in DC. I, I don't recall the name of it. And they said, yes, we'll release this album for you, but you got to take that song off of it because it's going to, you know, some people aren't going to like it. It's going to make some people angry. And it was in that decision of like, we wanted that label because we knew we would have distribution for it. We knew we would have, you know, it would get to the right college radio stations. It would get around the country. It would get to clubs. It would get, you know, we knew that, but we also felt like, no, that record, that song has got to be on the album. And we just said, you know what, we're, we're going to do it ourselves. Thank you very much, but we're not going to release it with you. And so we did it, you know, like we sent out four, we had a thousand albums pressed and 400 went to radio stations around, you know, from Alaska to, I sent one to um, Mikhail Barishnikov and congratulated him on Perestroika and Glasnost and just said, you're doing a great thing. I remember calling the embassy and saying, how do I address this um, envelope? Um, but yeah, I had a great team of friends that we called the Disappear Fear team and they like five or six friends and we you know were writing and sticking labels and 
trying to make sure the records didn't get broken. And we spent everything, you know, to, to do that. We did a big benefit concert and gave half the money to the Rape Crisis Center in Baltimore and half of it we used to get those records out. Um, and then later, just to tell you the story, just it just I think it's interesting is that the guy that was the president of that small indie label, who was a computer guy and he happened to be in Kansas City. We had a sold out show at a place called the Jazz House there and um he was it, the whole room just exploded it was just one of those great you know everybody's dancing it's practically mosh pit you know it's just insane and i see him and he said you know what you were right congratulations this was like three years later but it was like yes you know we we, we had done the right thing rounder records when we signed with them they were awesome i sent them like 20 songs or something and Ken um, Irwin was the guy there. It was like three people that led the label, but Ken was the one who signed me. Loved what I was doing, loved what we were about. Very supportive, very liberal. Um, he never said, you can't say this, you can't say that, you know? I mean, the only um, arguments I ever had with, with them was I was, <laughs> I was mad about a review that came out in Tower Records. They had a um, magazine and one of the guys from the office there um, uh, described that my music would be loved by the Patagonia crew and meaning that it was very superficial and very uppity and like, you know, like the luxury of, 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 of um, you know, complaining about something. And I was so angry. I asked Ken to just pull all my records out of Tower, pull all our stuff out of Tower Records. And my manager had to calm me down because apparently I, my demeanor did not seem that I would use the F-bomb or anything like that, but I was, I was very, they didn't pull them out, but um, I was not happy about that review, but, because it was the complete opposite of that. I was like, no, <laughs> no. Anyway, yeah, pretty interesting. But they were a great label. They were very supportive. Move on to a, a moment in your life that might have been a, a difficult one. I'm interested to hear your perspective. Your sister, Cindy, decided to quit the band and pursue other interests. What made you decide to pursue a solo musical career? And did you have any fears or reservations? And I also wanted to ask your initial reaction when you heard the news from your sister that she wanted to pursue other interests. <sighs> yes, that was a really difficult I was, I, I mean, really, I was spinning for about 10 years after that. I was just on this like, what kind of thing, because she was not, you know, she was my confidant. She was my closest, she was my best friend. Um, we had been on this very exciting journey together and I wasn't sure how it was going to go. The thing was this, is that um, one, you know, I was the older sister and I think um, I sort of had my thumb on her a little bit too much. I think I needed to like back up a little bit and give her a little bit more space for what she was doing in retrospect. I definitely feel that way. Although we did seem to listen to each other, but um, in some ways as you know, I think for myself, I was more single-minded about the creativity and allow and not see and she took care of the um you know the financial matters and and balancing out things like that more um do you do you think in any way obviously you're, you're very close as siblings and you share this musical journey life on the road forming a band together it becomes a business venture because you do it as your careers yeah. Do you think it changed the dynamic? Do you think it changed the relationship in any way when you decided to terminate that musical relationship? Well, it wasn't my choice. I mean, I do really did not want Cindy to leave at all. What happened was um, she had gotten married and that was all great. And then she got pregnant. That was all great. Um, but she, she, um, 
she just we just figured that we're gonna have she's gonna have a baby and we're gonna put throw the baby in the van and it's just gonna rattle along with its rattles and everything else that's rattling as we you know bumble down the road so we had no idea what we what what being a mom and uh, you know and and it turns out that um her eldest son um dylan um has um asperger's and so he required more attention and care and he really what happened was we took him in the van we in 94 the the in june the record the cd released and we we're touring everywhere and across you know and we we made we made it our way out to la you know crisscrossing playing all those gigs on our way out probably about 30 shows and um and when we got to la dylan stopped eating and he just wouldn't eat we had um three vans we had the band van which was me and the guys we had a roadie van which was my tour manager and my um, merch guy and all the equipment and then we had the little minivan for cindy the nanny and dylan and so instead of one tour bus because i don't know that's why we we that was my brilliant so um you know i i yeah so anyway so that's how we did it we were in shifts and and stuff um cindy could leave early and get in early um back to dylan because dylan would wake up at six in the morning even if cindy got back to bed at three and you know those were the gigs that were 10 to 2 pr pretty much you know in the morning so um uh it was it was tough but she did have the nanny suzanne galler helped her out but it was it was hard and when dylan stopped eating in la he just he just basically just stopped um and this was was august uh tom cindy's husband flew out and they they flew back to baltimore and that was it cindy was just you know it's just like dylan has to start eating again and he did he just needed like a very regular schedule not like here and there and did it you know and maybe he was also feed, you know uh feeding sense uh, as in a metaphor of what cindy was experiencing too because it was it's crazy you know it's crazy and so that was that she was off that tour the launch tour for the for the disappear for yourself titled and we had just um i believe we had just signed our our, our second publishing deal which was with warner chapel um music out of LA. That's the other thing I think that happened when we were out there. So yeah, it was, um, it, it was a crazy time. And she just thought, well, you know what, he's an infant, I'll take care of him, then we can throw him in the van, you know, and, and that just really didn't happen. You know, Cindy would say, well, I can come out and I can do these three shows. And so it wasn't like, a, I'm not working with you again. As a matter of fact, she always wanted me to keep the door open. It wasn't until I realized that Dylan was a senior in high school that, you know, she's really not coming back to work with me. And that was 17 years later. So it was a very long process of, um, of everything. But in the interim, I will say that my drummer and my um, keyboard player picked up the harmony. So where Cindy was singing and they were good. I mean, they, they knew the songs, they were there from me just saying, Hey, will this song work to the whole recording of it? So, you know i'm playing them every night so all over the place and they were it was a very tight family kind of band let's turn turn to your experiences and work as um a solo performer because you've traveled and performed all around the world incredibly in countries like jerusalem fiji germany australia and and several others what are the most memorable experiences performing outside of america and can you share with us some of the places and venues you've most enjoyed performing and and why? Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind is performing in a bomb shelter in 2006 during the um, Second Lebanon War in northern Israel um, in, a, in, in, in a place called Shorashim. And um, at that time, there were between like 200 and 300 rocket, rockets each day being lobbed into, um, sh shot into, to, into that area of Israel. And, um, and you weren't allowed to gather in a room 
with more than four, four or five people without it being a secure room or it being a bomb shelter. And we would get the, the uh, alarms. You could hear the, the sirens where we would have to get into a secure area because the bombs were coming. And um, the decision to go to Israel two weeks before that concert was really tormenting me because I didn't want to die, but I also couldn't live with myself having named the band Disappear Fear. And I had, you know, if it had any authenticity to it, if it meant anything really, I needed to go there because otherwise it meant nothing and I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. So once I made that decision, it was the tormenting part was before I made the decision. But once I made that decision, of course, I didn't want to die, but I was like, I got to do this. And so going there and doing that really was okay. Yes, I was scared when we were driving up. You couldn't, um, you, you couldn't move around during the day because that's when all the missiles were coming in. They didn't shoot the missiles at night because if they had shot the missiles at night, they would have been able to track where the missile came from, which is why when you saw what was happening in Lebanon and stuff, it was just like so much carpet bombing is because they didn't know exactly where it was coming from. They only knew an area. So when they would retaliate, they would say, well, it's, some, it's coming from here somewhere. It's, you just learn about these things. Um, uh, but it was so amazing to be in the bomb shelter all together. And when you are in that situation, you don't know, is this is like if we were in war, if we were in Odessa right now or Kiev, and I look at your face, I don't know if it's the last face I'm going to ever see. Because every moment, every piece of a moment is, could be your last one. And life becomes monumentally, exponentially, Look, everything you think about, your glass of water, your phone, your energy, everything is you have unlimited gratitude for in, in, in this kind of situation. So I had a glimpse of that when I was in Israel then. Very powerful. I'm getting for clumped here. Um, Do you think when you're put in those situations and obviously – coming from one of the richest countries in the world, the, the United States. Do you think it radically changes your perspective about people, society, and your philosophy in, in general? Do you think it's changed you in any ways by seeing, you know, being in that position in a, in a in practically a, in a war zone? Yes, absolutely. Which, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, it, it would be nice to be able to, you know, before, before I started Sony and the Night Band, I, I was going to, I considered joining the military so I could get it to turn around. <laughs> I thought the way to get the United States military, I, I thought it would be use the organizational skills, but like make it into this massive arts organization, you know, like really expand the funding for the bands and the music. And instead of bombs, they could just do like sky painting, you know, we'd have like amazing sky painting with the Air Force, you know, like making just amazing murals in the sky <laughs> and just all just really constructive, positive, constructive work, not <clears throat> violence, not uh, breaking things down, but that didn't happen because I came out to my recruiter. I said, um, she says, she, the question was, do you think you would ever, um, have, have you ever had a, a, a lesbian experience or gay experience? And I said, yes. And the, and she said, yeah, but you'll never do that again. And I said, I think I will. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the end of it. She like closed up her briefcase and, and said, well, just let me know if you change your mind about that. And it was like, and she left. Because I got like a really good grade. I could have been like, I don't know, espionage or something, you know. I was very proud because I usually do terrible on standard tests. But anyway, I divert. But um, I, that was my closeness with that. But yes, I, I wish the sentiment, I wish the heart of America was more exercised than at times it seems 
you know, it seems that the financial powerful uh, or, or idea of power really corrupts um, and, and, and um, poisons the real premise and promise that the United States ideology could do. Because I think a lot of people feel like I do. I just don't know if they're, you know, running, you know, it, they get beaten down, <laughs> you know. From your perspective and seeing different cultures and different countries, in incredibly, I want to move on and talk about sharing the stage with two of your music icons, sorry, I idols, Bruce Springsteen <laughs> and, and Pete Seeger. Can you recall <laughs> those two experiences? And I wanted to specifically ask you, did you meet them both? And what is it about their music that you find so inspiring? Yes. Um, so I'll talk about Bruce Springsteen first. Um, there's a wonderful event called the Light of Day Festival that happens in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And now I believe there are different ones that happen around the world to address Parkinson's disease. And um, the founder of the festival lost his mom to Parkinson's and um, and another uh, promoter of the festival um, also has a, uh, lost someone very dear to, to him um, with that disease. So Bruce um, comes over and um, plays um, this concert and I happen to be booked the many years. It's not really very well publicized because it's a small venue. It only, it's the, um, uh, the, the, the theater in Asbury Park and it's right on the water. And it probably only holds maybe about 1200 people. It's really nice. It's actually a really nice size theater and good sound and everything. And um, uh, my manager, Tony Palagrosi, um, was, is one of the promoters of that festival. And he worked with me also in the early nineties, Disappear Fear, um, and invited me to, to do it. And Bruce usually comes in at, around the end and then there's a big play together. And so, but I knew, um, um, and it, it's, it's very special. He's, he's, he's amazing. He just has this, like, I'm a huge fan. I mean, um, you know, I'm a fanatic, <laughs> but, um, but he just has this glow about him. And, um, I, I love his music. I love that, you know, he, he digs in deep. He does it cause he has to do it. Um, as I, as, as I, as do I. And um, there's something very special about uh, uh, about him and about that. Um, he's quite the wordsmith. And um, I worked, I, I had known Bruce though from prior to that though, I worked with Bruce, um, Bruce's keyboard player, Roy Bitten. Uh, yeah, produced my, um, incredible musician, yeah. Yes, produced my Seed in the Sahara album. And that was in 1996. So when they were playing again as a band with Bruce and the E Street Band, I could I got backstage passes to meet and saw, you know, what it's like being backstage there, which mwah, it's the best backstage ever. Um, you know, all the right champagne, all the right hors d'oeuvres, all the right everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, and I, I played with Gary Talent before several times actually in, in Nashville for a um, uh, an evening at the Bluebird called the First Amendment Group, and it's about censorship in the music industry and and having some freedom. And I became a part of that also because some of my songs have been censored on the radio. So, um, yeah. Uh, so as you might imagine. So, <laughs> um, and uh, let's see. So yeah. So so th there's all that, and then. Um, and then with Pete, with Pete Seeger, he, Pete um, created this festival called the Clearwater Folk Festival. And it was a benefit to clean up the Hudson, that part of the Hudson River where he lived. And um, so I was invited to play that festival several times. And um, Pete, I, I also got to hang out with Pete at another event that was um, about public radio stations meeting and, um, putting together ideas internationally too, putting together ideas to, you know, uh, for a lot of community support 
Um, and so, yeah, I, one, one time Pete, uh, and, and I were, were sharing the stage and there was Buddy Guy and, uh, Dar Williams and Holly Near and Toshi Reagan, um, who maybe you've heard of her mom. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she, her mom started the band Sweet Honey on the Rock, which was a really good gospel band. It's actually based in DC, but very powerful band, vocal acapella band. Um, and, uh. I may be leaving someone out. I hope not. But um, we were all sharing the stage and, and I, I, I took out my Parker Fly, which is a semi-acoustic sound, but it looks like an electric guitar. And I said, I turned around to Pete and I go, don't worry, Pete, this won't hurt a bit. But we, um, he's just, he's just, a, he was just a wonderful man, a great guy. You know, he gave it everything he could when he had this much voice, you know, he, he gave you this much voice. Um, towards the end, he really only performed like maybe, maybe about three, three or four songs, but he gave it all. I got everybody singing and he really taught me. And I think so many people for decades, how to get people singing together, you know, like throw in the lyrics a little, like, and I do imagine in Germany, a lot of times now people know the lyrics more than me, but just, you know, you just kind of throw them out there in between the verses and then everybody knows what they're singing when the, when it comes around and then you say it and then, you know, you kind of, you double sing it. <laughs> um, but that's what people want to do. People want to, you know, people want to come together. That's who we are, really. You know, that's when we're living. Talking about coming together, you've been an advocate and you've championed many issues and and causes that are important to you and close to your heart. Can we discuss uh, your humanitarian work and what social, political and charitable issues are most important to you and why? And also want to discuss some of the awards, recognition and accolades you've received in your Middle East tour in 2006, where you founded the charity Guitars for Peace. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll work backwards. Guitars for Peace. Um, I founded with uh, two friends up from a uh, doctor and a um, counselor from Massachusetts, and we, we made this nonprofit organization. And it started with me doing a concert in a Palestinian village called Bida in 2006. And a friend of mine named Hannah Mermelstein, uh, who only would speak in English and Arabic, um, was doing a lot of work in, in for Palestinians and with regard to the occupation and um, invited me to perform at this village. So we had to take several buses out of, we were in Tel Aviv and we had to get on the right buses because you can only, you have to be on, you know, you have to know the right bus to get onto in order to get into the village. So we did and um, uh, the, all the girls were singing so no, so no, like super, super loud, and it was echoing. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> Jewish American, you know, a double whammy. Well, lesbian, we don't even go there, triple whammy, coming into this Palestinian village to sing. And we just were right there. Like it was an all girls' day camp, which reminded me of my camp, Camp Louise, which was a sleepover camp. But that feeling of just like, it's summer, we're free, we're together. What are, you know, let's have a great time. And and they were doing folk dancing and different music and I played songs with them and they loved it. And um, they wanted to keep my guitar. They didn't have one there. And it was about 110, 120, you know, girls between the ages, of like maybe six and 16. And, um, and I said, oh no, no, I, I cannot give you this guitar. This is like my body, but I, um, but I will get you one. And so that is what created the idea for me. Like I should get them guitars so they can play. Cause that's like, you know, that was my boat into out of uh, loneliness and um, uh, distress and um, confusion. That was, you know, the guitar was my vehicle out of, uh, out of that. And, and, and also my vehicle into, to, to get to go to different countries and play for different people and, experienced all the a lot of amazing things around this world um especially the food <laughs> and um, um i love the food and the the lebanese food in israel is the best food best uh, lentil spicy lentils and lamb and uh, i love the food the middle mediterranean middle eastern food there anyway um 
Uh, so I did. So Hannah, I got a guitar. Uh, a friend of mine didn't want her, didn't want one anymore. It was collecting dust in her closet and we cleaned it up and got new strings on it. And then I gave it to Hannah and I signed it and she uh, delivered it to, um, she happened to be back in our area before she was going back to, to, um, uh, Israel and and she gave it to them and then they sent me a picture of it and it was like yes and then I was thinking well there are a lot of children around the world particularly in third world countries that would do so well if they could have a guitar could have an instrument um, so I began collecting them and getting them to to to, to children in different places and um, it felt very good but the thing was is that I now what I do is there's an organization called hungry for music and this is a guy that does it full time with lots of reasons. we had a benefit i had um and we, that we we launched it with the benefit many of the people in the room brought like a trumpet and a stand-up bass and like lots of really cool instruments that he was able to that he's able to get and also they uh, supply a teacher too to give a couple lessons to get them started and like this is the strings this is the e string this is the you know and uh, and I feel very very good about that. Um, that that was a good thing. Um, I, as far as causes go, you know, doing music. I always, as a kid, and as a young, as a teenager, particularly when I was like figuring out who I was sexually, like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, why why is this bad? Why is this forbidden? This is love. How could something in my heart that's so real for me be wrong? It just didn't seem right. And um, and whereas many minorities, like for instance, let's say it's a, uh, 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 a German family coming to Baltimore, they don't speak English, they have a different culture. When that child goes home from school, at least that child goes home to German people, like it's family. But with a gay situation, you have to create your own family because you go home to your family and there's not another gay person there. And there's, it's, it was, you know, such a, uh, um, forbidden, um, thing to be, to, to, you know, not in the family, not in the religion, not on television, not in the media. There was nothing. It was just all, you know, except maybe some, uh, dark novels, you know, that you could find or some nasty magazine somewhere. And that was a world I didn't, couldn't relate to as a, you know, suburban middle-class Jewish kid. <laughs> um, and, um, and it just seemed crazy. So it was like, you know, I, I say sometimes that if Joni Mitchell had been gay, maybe I wouldn't have needed to write my songs, <laughs> but darn it, she wasn't. <laughs> and so someone had to sing, sing something. And I just wanted to have songs that really related to me that were on the radio you know good pop songs at the time that um that said you know i was scared to kiss you because i didn't know you know that you were like me or 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 could ever feel like me you know because you're so beautiful and things like this you know like you know you don't fit the picture of of what a lesbian's supposed to look like you know or or this kind of thing and um yeah, so so the, certainly the LGBT gay causes and and playing a lot of a lot of human rights festivals in that direction, uh, in the early days of Disappear Fear, we were the go to. We we performed in I performed in Laramie, Wyoming before Matthew Shepard was uh, murdered there, and after, um, lots of places that would have uprisings or incommunications, they bring sort of us in because I think Disappear Fear was like sort of a bridge between you know, being straight, being gay, um, that sort of thing. We had a, a little riot happen down in, um, in, uh, in, um, I'm just trying to think what it, it where it was in Alabama. Um, uh, I can't think of the name of the city, but we were at a college and we we um, we were in our contract. It said we were not allowed to use the word that and it that had anything to do with homosexuality on our in our performances. No songs could have the word homosexuality, lesbian, gay, anything that 
you know, dyke, whatever, no, no words in songs or anything like that. Well, I have a song called Sink the Censorship. And in that song is the word lesbian, which, um, so I didn't want to do the concert. I said to Cindy, I said, we shouldn't, it was a, we were on a band tour. And frequently if we had like a gig that, you know, we were making maybe $2,500 on for the gig the next night that was in a, uh, in a city or, you know, you know, basically that didn't know us, we were going to, for the band, which was four other guys, we'd be making $200 and that was not going to cover food, gas and hotels to get us. So we'd use the big anchor show of the university to feed us, to get us to the next places. And that's really how it worked. And um, so the band wasn't there, um, but but we were, they, they either stayed at the hotel or they just came to see us and sold t-shirts for us. But we, we were the performers, we were being paid for it. And I didn't want to do it. And Cindy said, we need to do it. She says, we speak to everybody. It's not just the LGBT community that our music is about disappear fear. It's about anybody who's feeling alienated for any reason. And I said, yeah, that's true. So we agreed to, um, to do the concert and to, um, apply, you know, by their rules, censor ourselves. So we're doing the concert and we're about, ha we change things around. We're about halfway through it and we're about to do the song, Sink the Censorship. And, um, which was a, basically a letter to, uh, the Senator who, the North Carolina Senator who was very anti homosexual and diverted funds that might have been used for AIDS research directly away from that because it was only for gay people and it was a good thing that they were dying. Horrible, horrible, uh, man, <laughs> ideologically. And, um, so, um, uh, so we, so I, so we're, we're, we're about to start seeing censorship. Cindy turns around and I see that she's like crying like I mean really crying and her face is all wet she's red and I'm like what's wrong and she goes this is so wrong this is so wrong we should not be we should not be changing the words and I said we we got paid for this we can't we have to we have to do this and um and um she was just really upset and I said look I said for the word lesbian just use European because <laughs> it like came up for the same amount of syllables and I said and pull yourself together just you know pull yourself together so we turn around and I'm starting calling that boy to the dinner table and you know and she's just like you know trying to wipe herself off and and do it and I and we change the word and then I stop the song and I said you know I said this is wrong I said we took this show because, but we've got to be true to our music. I said, if you really want to hear our music, follow me outside. So I, and I unplug my guitar and the whole room gets up and, to, and I, we, we, not only could we not sing the song, sing, do that on the stage, but we couldn't do it on the campus. So we had to walk, we were figuring on walking out of the doors, down the grassy land, past the parking lot, away from the buildings, like, this, and this was going to be, you know, like three, 400 people with us moving this in this direction. And what happened was they were, the audience rushed the stage and security separated me and Cindy. And I have like my guitar, you know, it's like trying to, and, and moved us each to opposite rooms in the place and the concert was over. And so we didn't get to play anymore, but they bought all our merchandise. So we, we did, we did, we did. Okay. We fulfilled enough of the contract. They didn't take our money back um or anything and that was but it did hurt us playing um some colleges in that part of the country um it, it definitely but you know here we are <laughs> outside of the recording studio in Turin, you've composed soundtracks for film and tv projects can you discuss your involvement in this process and talk about some of the work you've done, which include the team movie Frog and the Wombat, the documentary Autumn's Harvest, and the 1985 horror movie Igor and the Lunatics. <laughs> it's a very big project to do a soundtrack for a film. You know, you're um, 
but it's like it's just another dimension of who they are so that character it's just really just bringing bringing other dimension to that character you have uh you have what they're about, maybe who they love, what they look like, how, what their lighting's going to be, what their costume's going to be. And the music really just becomes a theme for who they are, whatever that is. Um, it's done in, you know, if you think about it in classical music, when you hear a certain uh, t t uh, melody, you know um, that it's the Nutcracker and or you know that it's um, Laura, uh, the young, the young, uh, the young girl. And um, and it's the same thing. So there, so with Igor, or we say Igor, but Igor and the lunatics, um, each of the characters had a theme, music, and then that got embellished into the music of what was happening in the uh, particular event. Like, um, And it was fun to me to do that. That was really what I thought I was going to be doing when I graduated college. I thought, you know, if this, if I can't uh, uh, make it as a singer songwriter, uh, rock and roll star, <laughs> then um, then maybe I can write music for films. So that was like my backup idea because I I had to do music, and um, yeah, it was it was a big um, it was a very it was it was it was very challenging. I was conducting in the studio. I didn't know how to write the music down, but I I worked on the basic themes with my I used my band and a guest guitar player, who was great and. Um, and we and we we did it. We were literally watching them. I'm literally watching the movie. I'm not going to a. It's 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 very archaic. It was it's probably something similar to you know the guy that played piano for the silent movies at the theater. You know da 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 da. You know like okay. You know because you know it comes next because you've watched it you know 400 times. So. Um, and uh, yeah, that was that was that. Um, Autumn's um, Autumn's Harvest was a was a is a great film. It was it's a film about um, uh, it's a documentary inter interviews and 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 discussing and informing people about the spread of AIDS primarily through the immigrant farming community in the United States and how. How terrible that was! It really goes into the history of immigrant work, immigrant farm workers in Florida and different parts um, of of the country, primarily that area, the East Coast, um, and and the spread of AIDS and how there they might be immigrants from Mexico. They were a lot of them immigrants from Mexico. They would get AIDS from po prostitutes in the in the bigger cities because they were away from their families, and then go and bring it back to small rural communities in Mexico and on and on and how terrible that was. Um, uh, and there's a lot of, I learned a lot about immigrate. I learned a lot just making the movie, not just the making of it, but the content itself was really, it's a, it's a, it's a good film. And we did a lot of blues stuff for that. I wanted to, um, to bring that out and, and contacted uh, people I know that could sing the blues and play the blues and, wanted it to be as authentic as I could make it, um, that sort of thing. But yeah, soundtracks are, are a whole other animal. It's a lot easier in a way, because it, it, it's so, it's a lot of music, you know, like an average CD is like, you know, between 40 and 50 minutes long of songs of, you know, I get sp spoiled with that and then I can, you know, take it where I want to, but, uh, on that you're 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 on the you're on there you're on their highway so you're going to see the sites they want you to see and you need to um to to figure out how to bring color to that musically yeah sonia i've got one final question and then we move on to that moment where we ask all your take guests these quick fire questions to wrap up the interview uh and pete just, warned me about this sorry uh, yeah discover things <laughs> about you <laughs> maybe we didn't establish over the course of this interview but the final question i wanted to um ask you away from your hectic music schedule what are your hobbies and interests and do you have any long-term musical plans or ambitions and um, would you like to explore maybe other creative areas outside of music yes um I, I rediscovered my love for painting when uh, when we were making Disappear Fear self-titled. It was the first album 
that um, I wasn't producing it. And the producer sent me into the lobby area <laughs> because I was sort of pinging against the walls and I think it was driving him crazy. That would be Craig Cramp. So for his own good, the record's own good and my own good, um, uh, I went into the lobby area and my girlfriend had bought me a little watercolor, uh, a travel watercolor kit and uh, uh, a book of, ca of uh, paper, you know, the thick watercolor paper. And, um, and I started painting and it really, I had all this energy and I was just, it was really cool. And we ended up using, actually Rounder Records ended up using my artwork on the, uh, the painting, the, you know, the colorful lyrics in the book and the back cover of the album. And uh, so that worked out really well. And from that, I've um, developed, I've been commissioned for many works. I've done some murals in Europe and, um, I, I just finished uh, a painting for for some friends in Texas, and I'm working on another one now for a couple of friends in Nashville. So I, I do love that. Um, it's a different world, uh, and it's a very quiet one. I don't, I don't now. I don't listen. It's like I just hear nature, and 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 I'm, it's me and the it's me and the canvas. Um, I love it. So that's uh, that is something. I thought maybe maybe um, I, I've worked um, I've written one uh, the music and lyrics to one musical. I would like to do more with musicals. Um, I would like to see the one that we did, Small House No Secrets, really get a full production and um, and write any more music you know that might need to be for that, um, and then maybe do another musical. I'd like to I'd like to do the New York musical thing or perhaps London or <laughs> um, um, Germany or Sydney, you know, yeah. And it's possible um, that we, there's some discussion about doing that, that particular one in Germany. So um, musicals, music, I love in my off time, I, you know, I don't do it very much, but I love snow skiing um, too. I really enjoy that. I enjoy the water. I love boogie boarding, <laughs> um, taking the little board out and just, you know, body surfing Sonia, Sonia Rutstein we've come to that moment guest number 106 I believe um, you don't have to think of these questions about them in any detail they're just quick fire questions to find out things maybe we don't know about you or we've not discovered during the course of our conversation are you ready for part of this I am it's like being in the psychiatrist chair some people have said okay wait let me put my hood on then <laughs> okay i'm ready <laughs> here we go sonia with number one nice and simple what would you say is your favorite pastime eating chocolate from a chocolate now to maybe a film enthusiast we touched a little bit about film but specifically composition but if you had to choose a favorite movie, what would you choose and why? Ah, uh, Cinema Paradiso. I love that movie. Um, I love the music. I think it's Ennio Morricone. I think. Um, I love his music. Um, I also, I could think of so many other movies that are like right, right, right behind it. I love Dr. Zhivago and I love um, um, uh, Don Quixote. <laughs> Cin <laughs> cinema Paradiso is a great choice. I love films that highlight the cinema and the love of cinema and people's passion for filmmaking. I There's so many films about the actual industry itself, Sunset Boulevard is one, Cinema Paradiso, The Player, another great film. And Ennio Morricone wrote my favourite score as well, which is the Once Upon a Time in America score. Uh, um, uh -huh. Yeah, he's an incredible composer. And I like Scarface. Okay. He did like... that too. Oh, did he? Yeah. 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 I, I like your choice there. A nice choice. From Cinema Paradiso now, a great classic Italian film, to novelists, who would you cite as your favourite? Um, um, Gabriel. Uh, 
he did um oh uh, Mar marquez yes gabriel san marquez yeah yeah i need to brush up on my gabriel uh, marquez <laughs> um but i love that i love um the one um uh, I mean, I love the, the disappearing into eternity too, which I'm getting all the names wrong. But um, the first one I read was about the woman who loses her um, virginity and what they have to do about that. Um, yeah, so good. I love his writing. I love it. It's like the letters do come off the page. <laughs> we move on to professions next. If you could have chosen a different profession outside of music, what would it have been? Oh, um, perhaps a translator um, from a trans, like a diplomatic translator to translate one language to another language um, or a rabbi. <laughs> in, in, just to study, just to study and connect things. Inspirations now, we all have great inspirations in life people that maybe mentor us or give us advice or they influence you in some type of way but who would you say has been your greatest inspiration in life maybe my sister Cindy we talk newspapers now you're very political and you have a, a social conscience, but what would you say is, what is your choice of newspaper? Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? I um, I get the New York Times um, and I read the Washington Post quite a bit as well. But the New York Times is the, the main one. Chocolate was mentioned earlier on and also fine cuisine when you've travelled. But what would you say... Sonia, is your favorite food? Well, that could change in a, you know, you know, all of these things could change in a second. Right now, because we're talking about Middle East and I'm thinking of a falafel. They have these really good falafels that this guy from Turkey who lives in Basikheim makes. And I love them. I love the tahini sauce and I could eat one right now. <laughs> Um, in Basikheim is this small village in Germany that I stay in, um, and um, it, it's kind of like a one-horse town. You know, there's like one really good tur Turkish Middle Eastern restaurant, and it's right on the main strip, and <clears throat> definitely going to do that as soon as I get there. <laughs> I'm interested to hear your choice, having spoken to you over the course of the last 60 minutes, your choice of a cultural icon. Who would you choose? When we say a cultural icon, it could be maybe a musician, maybe a political figure, someone who has changed the course of history, could be somebody who's made a medical breakthrough. Who would you choose as a cultural, your favourite cultural icon? Charlie Chaplin. A very good choice. And, and from my native country as well. Yeah. 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 I, th I think I think Chaplin was a genius. Yes. He could do everything. Yes. Yeah. He was um, a musician. He was an actor. He was an acrobat. He was a comedian. There was so much. He was so versatile. Yes. And he he's started. A, he's a great, fi a, fi a great filmmaker as well. Great director. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And he started um, ASCAP, the artists and musicians um, music. Uh, company in in the united states which actually you got paid then for music not just the people that owned it but the people that created it it was huge what a breakthrough <laughs> so many things and he was also um a political figure he believed you know very much and he kind of got into trouble didn't he for his beliefs his convictions as well so that was kind of a another quite interesting side to to him as well yeah yeah wrongly so but right in the fact that he stood up for him his beliefs and never backed down i thought that was beautiful from charlie chaplin 
one of the great Hollywood icons and so famous for that, playing the tramp in those great slapstick silent films. We move on to curse words. What is your <laughs> favourite curse word and why? <laughs> um, it, it would have to be the F word um, because it's just so applicable to everything, <laughs> I, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and why? Um, you know, because it's it just you can say you can it can mean like it, you can say it when you're tired, you can say it when you're angry, you can say it when you're excited. It's just all that you what you put behind it, and you know. You, you could probably do that with a lot of different words. I mean, you could probably take the word blue and say, well, blue you. Or you could say like, oh, blue, like, blue. you know, like you could take any word with that emotion, but every, but that, the F word seems to um, uh, be in all those places that people just naturally take it there. So I think that's pretty powerful. <laughs> Now we come on to travel, and I wish I could travel because it's so blooming cold where I'm <laughs> sat at the moment. I could do Aww. with a holiday, Aww. but you've been to so many different places. But what is your favorite place or holiday destination? Um, I had a beautiful time um, on my, on um, my honeymoon in um, Bora Bora. That was really, really, really beautiful. The water's so clear and warm and so many things you can see. I really love that. Although I also really, really love the um, beaches along the coast of, this is where you should go, Australia, in the northern part, the Sunshine Coast, the Golden Coast, because the beaches are white and beautiful and clean. Like, um, and also the beaches of, um, in, around the Mediterranean, it's that powdery white sand, nothing to cut your feet. Like on the beaches on the East Coast in the US, there's shells and there's stuff. And same with a lot of Hawaii, there's, you know, they, the, I guess the currents are whatever they are. So you get, you know, get stuff. <laughs> or, but Australia, you have to be careful because if you get in the really Northern parts, there's those hundred foot stingers that can kill you <laughs> they're bad the question you never want to ask a musician particularly when you've cited so many influences and different sources from blues to folk and all kinds of different genres but i'm gonna ask you it who would you say is your favorite music artist and what is your all-time favorite album my favorite music artist is Louis Armstrong, and my favorite musical artist my no my favorite musical album is um hotter than July Stevie Wonder. I love that album from Satchmo now eh? to your greatest uh, achievement to date <laughs> what is it? What would you say is your greatest achievement so far? Oh, um, not giving up. <laughs> a nice answer. And the final one, Sonia. Sonia Rutstein, we go very deep now. How do you wish to be remembered? What the, what comes to mind is like light. Sonia, the final question of today, but not the final chapter in your life, all your musical endeavours and all the different choices and things you will do, um, the remainder of it. But thanks for being a guest. Um, interviewee 106 on your take. Um it's been a been a fascinating journey and insight 
where we've covered all kinds of things from childhood to your Jewish roots. You've spoken about some of the, the issues and concerns that you have, your convictions, influences, so many things we've covered. And it's been fascinating. And thank you kindly, not just for your time, but for being a guest. And finally, we should also mention all the technical issues we've had two or three <laughs> times. So it was third time lucky, touch wood. Yes. We got there in the end. But thank you kindly. It was um a really interesting interview and one of my favorites that I've done. It was um fascinating to listen to and, and hear. And um yeah, just a great intellectual mind and your concerns and some of the things you've mentioned have just been very interesting to listen to and hear. Thank you so much. I would like to, have you been interviewed like you? No. <laughs> we need to do that. We need to do that. Maybe. I'm, um, I'm not sure that's a good idea. I think it's a great idea. And we can call that one my take. And um, we could have <laughs> me and Pete do it with you. Yeah, that's quite, it, that could be quite interesting. Yeah. Want to? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should yeah, do it. I might I take you up to. on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could, yeah that could be quite interesting you can but, write the question the questions if you want um but it's, it's I, quite, just flip it it's quite interesting you mentioned um i don't know why i've got a pen in my hand but it's interesting because um you mentioned that because i did a course today i've been doing a voiceover course a uh, voiceover for commercials for radio We've actually a guest who did a your take and for, it was the last one today. It was over the course of 10 weeks. And the final task was to write my name on a piece of paper and write about trials and tribulations in my life, things that I've been proud of in my career. So that was quite, yeah, it's quite interesting that you've touched upon, yeah, uh, a timely moment, but that aside, <laughs> whether it happens or not, I just finally wanted to ask you, where do we find out more about you and specifically listen to the music? Ah, um, I've just uploaded most of my music on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the, the streaming platforms, all the big familiar ones. Um, um, you can find it at, at my website, soniadisappearfear.com pretty much everything's there. Um, sometimes um, my early stuff is under just it, the words disappear fear. And that music is still owned by Concord, is distributed by Concord Music Distribution or rather Universal. And um, Concord is owned by Universal. And um, so disappear fear, self-titled album, Seed in the Sahara and Almost Chocolate, those three CDs are all um, distributed by Universal, so I don't have any say on those, but everything else is on Disappear Records, um, and you can find those at my website and most streaming platforms, and I'm still doing um, more uploading for for the distribution. for, for And you can buy stuff. You can buy the hard copies, vinyl, um, and CDs, and we have them, and some cassettes, <laughs> too. <laughs> All the best for the future, and thanks again for taking part and being a guest on your take. Ah, thank you. We're going to do you. 